Here we go. Good evening. This is the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education meeting. Welcome. Um, we had our closed session, excuse me, while I go through all of this. Hay alguien aquí que necesita intérprete para la junta? No veo a nadie. Okay. Uh, we will start with this meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Mr. Pace. <laughs> um, or broadcasted. Images and sounds may be captured of those attending this meeting. And we will ha now have our um, student rep lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you. I do have some from on approval of the agenda. Oh, we're reordering. Yes. Okay. So um, don't confuse me. It doesn't take much. <laughs> we have 3B, and this is approval of the agenda. And what we're all talking about is we are moving n item 9E up to basically to follow 9A. So it'll be 9B, but it's really 9E. Got that? Got it. Okay, so I will accept a motion. Move to approve. Do I have a second? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. General public comments. We have two, and we have Robert, and these are three minutes each, please. Robert Cepeda? Yes, and come right up to the um, podium, please. Good evening. My name is Robert Cepeda. I was born and raised here in Gilroy. I am not a parent nor a legal guardian. However, I am here to discuss a topic that should be of concern to everyone. To those that are unaware, children are being sexually exploited in the United States. I will provide two examples of this. Last week, Claremont Unified School District President Stephen Lanusa invited students to his home to participate in a private adult party. The so-called event had alcoholic beverages and inappropriately dressed male entertainers who were encouraging the children to drink. The Dirty Santa, along with the shirtless entertainers, made disgusting comments towards the children. Since then, Stephen Lanusa has resigned and the investigation is still ongoing. Furthermore, in Chicago, the Dean of Students at Francis W. Parker Private School, Joseph Bruno, was shown on video discussing the activities being allowed to children. He says, and I quote, I had like our LGBTQ plus health center come in. They were passing around butt plugs and dildos to my students, talking about queer sex, using lube versus using spit. They were just like passing around dildos and butt plugs. The kids were just playing with them, looking at them. They're like, how does this butt plug work? How do we do, like, how does this work? End of quote. This sexualization towards children must not be accepted or allowed in any school, public or private. Parents and legal guardians entrust these individuals who claim to be protecting and educating children when in fact they are not. I hope to be clear on this issue that is going on within our school system in the United States. It is not transphobic nor homophobic to be advocating the safety and security of innocent children who attend the classroom to learn. 
the grooming and mutilating of children must be rejected and properly punished. Punishment with justice must be served. Thank you. Thank you. We have a second speaker, uh, Kenya Perez. Did I get that first name right? Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kenya Perez. I am a parent of a 14 year old here in the city of Gilroy. I am here to uh, represent Parents Helping Parents. It's an agency who support and uh, advise and guide families when Excuse there is- Excuse me, could you start over again? <laughs> we had a little disruption up here and we'll, start, we'll give you the extra 20 seconds, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I lost my train of thought. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so did we. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, my name is Kenya Perez. I'm here representing Parents Helping Parents. It's an agency that helps families with special needs um, of all ages. I have um, information to provide for the community. If there is a child, uh, adult, or a uh, young teenager who needs support in growing up, one of the things that I provide is a support group here in the city. I have an office location. It's a pretty small one, but I'm trying to communicate this to the whole community that um, if you're looking for any resources in regarding public benefits, regarding any information about transitioning to adulthood, a lot of the 17 to 18 year old public benefits that we provide information training, also parent training, because a lot of families don't understand what is special needs or mental health? So one of the things I can tell you, it's a struggling couple of years for everybody, but in more is for families with special needs. I, I can share with you, I have a 14 year old and we are struggling. And one of the things I can ha have for him is my balance in life. So as a parent, I need support. And I believe that other parents in the community do need this kind of resource. So I ask you, please provide this information for to, to other families as well. Um, I do speak Spanish, <laughs> if you can't tell. So I am a bilingual resource specialist for the community as well. I have a couple of flyers here that I'm gonna leave for the board. If you can please help me out to spread the word to the community and maybe I can also provide any training for families regarding public benefits like IHSS or any resources in the community like the, like vocational programming for students or an adult in the community as well. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your patience with us tonight. And that's it for our public comment. So 3D is report of action taken in closed session and we have several. Um, we have readmission of readmission of, of students to schools maintained by the district. The board unanimously approved the readmission of 10 students. The motion passed unanimously with trustees Aguirre, Theoc, Good, Mora Kim, Nelson, Pace, and Piceno all voting yes. <laughs> Conference with legal counsel Existing litigation, the board unanimously approved a settlement agreement to resolve a student's educational claim. The motion again passed unanimously with trustees Aguirre, Aguirre sorry, Theoc, Good, Mora Kim, Nelson, Pace, and Piceno all voting yes. Conference with legal counsel initiation of litigation. The board directed legal counsel to initiate or intervene in a legal action. The action, the defendants, and the other particulars will be disclosed to any person upon inquiry unless to do so would jeopardize the district's ability to effectuate service of process on one or more observed parties or that to do so would jeopardize the district's ability to conclude existing settlement negotiations to its advantage. The motion passed unanimously with trustees Aguirre, Fiat, Good, Mora Kim, Nelson, Pace, and Piceno all voting yes. And, and we, ha and they're not on here. <laughs> they're open session, but they're not. I think they're normally in the first session. I think we do too. Okay. Oh, and I don't have the, 
I didn't bring my cheat sheet. Thank you. Do you have that? We are a bit uh, discombobulated today. Yeah, yep, got it, got it, got it. Okay, we have some um, expulsions to vote on. Are we ready, trustees? Okay, um, case 2023-13. Move to expel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Case 2023-15. Move to expel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Case 20, Case 2023-16. Move to expel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Okay. Did I get that? Case 2023-17. Move to expel. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Last, case 2023-18. Move to expel. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And now we have item four, annual reorganization. And clearly we need to organize. <laughs> <laughs> so recognition of outgoing board member, Angelica Villa. First of all, I wanna apologize for my phone going off. I don't even know how to set the timer. So God knows how I did that, but I apologize for interrupting you. It's my pleasure this evening to speak about two of our board members. So the first thing I'd like to do is ask Enrique to come up. Enrique has just served four years on our board and I'd like to say a few words about him tonight. So first I wanna thank Enrique for his willingness to serve on the board for four years. Most people don't understand all the work, time, responsibility involved in being on the school board. In my mind, it is one of the ultimate forms of community service. It was clear from the beginning of his term that Enrique chose to serve on the board because of his commitment to students, staff, and schools in our district. His experiences as a parent for many years in our district definitely benefited his actions as a board member. There are many things that I appreciate about Enrique's service on the school board these last four years. Every board member has a unique set of background experiences which creates a diverse group of people serving on the school board. Enrique brought a background in cutting edge technology to the board meetings, offering a unique perspective in particular in the IT information technology area. He approached topics and agenda items with enthusiasm, as in asking good questions to further his understanding. He advocated for items that directly impacted students and staff. He suggested in innovative approaches and topics for the board and the district's consideration. Enrique brought a global perspective to the board. His life experiences lent a unique perspective to initiatives being considered by the board on behalf of our staff and students. He always strived to be the voice for all students. On a lighter note, we are eternally grateful for his photography skills, especially at big events where our staff was responsible for the log logistics on the day of. We could always count on Enrique for beautiful and thoughtful photos that captured the essence of the day. And you'll see some of those shortly in my superintendent's report from the topping off event at South Valley. Enrique, on behalf of the Board of Education, the staff, 
and, and on my behalf, thank you for your service to the board and our school communities over the last four years. The Diaz family is a true GUSD success story. As your children are graduates, went on to college and have done very well, and your wife is one of our star teachers. So many thanks to you for your time and commitment to making GUSD the best that it can be. So we have a, we have a plaque for you. Great. We have a plant for you. And then Melanie in her, and Lucy in there, put their creative juices on Enrique Love's Tapatio. So, Linda, you can It's been stay. a pleasure serving with you, Enrique. <laughs> uh, I have a question, a quick question. Do you want to do one without the masks? Just, I mean, just sure. hold your breath or something? I mean, because this is forever. Okay. It's not forever. You can come back on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention this at the beginning, but we are urging people to wear masks in uh, the district office and in other settings because the numbers of absences right now of staff and students is really high from COVID. So we do have masks back there if anybody wants to grab one. Anyway, every time we have our annual organizational meeting, we recognize the outgoing board president also and I always get the privilege of speaking about the outgoing pro president. And in Linda's case, um, first she served for vice president for two years while Mark was president, and now she's president. And about five years ago, she did it, that same thing. She was vice president and president. So I think we figured out in five of her eight years, she's been on the executive committee. <laughs> and she's done a great job. And prior to serving on, on the school board, for those in the audience that may not know this, Linda a was a longtime staff member in the district. How many years? 32 years in the district. She Later in her career, she was a principal, and she ended here at the district office as the assistant superintendent for HR. And I say that because obviously her background and experiences in the district have been an invaluable resource to the board. And it's no doubt contributed to the great job that she's done in this role as president. For the public, the board president devotes many hours to this role above and beyond the normal duties of being a board member. I have much more contact with the board president and vice president, uh, sometimes daily with the board president. And uh, that's not limited to Monday through Friday. It's seven days a week. Linda's very responsive to my emails, texts, phone calls at all times of the day. And we've worked very closely this past year. I have tremendous admir admiration and respect for her leadership and her dedication and greatly appreciate all the time and effort she's devoted to this job. During, we have bi -week, bi-monthly, bi-weekly executive committee meetings 
where the president, vice president, and I meet, and we uh, prepare these board agendas that you have in front of you this evening, and they give me direction about a lot of different topics. During the board meeting, she ensures that meetings run smoothly, and she's been an active participant in the dis discussions. <laughs> there are hiccups here or there, but that's, that's nothing. And she does an excellent job of facilitating our board meetings, and she always treats everyone with respect. She does her homework. She studies in advance the board agendas. We get a lot of questions from her in advance, usually on the weekend, and we really appreciate that. And she always puts students first and demonstrates her commitment to providing the best educational program for our schools. Linda, as a, the executive uh, member, she also participates in the facilities committee and those often are three to four hours a month and attends construction site visits. And additionally, the three of us meet monthly with the mayor and city administrator. She's been on many school site visits in the fall and the spring and she attends so many events. Linda, the board and I'd like to present you with some special tokens of our appreciation for all your hard work, dedication and time you devoted as president of the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education. So the special, really special present is, Linda just became a grandmother, and we want to help you start your first library for your granddaughter. Awesome. And this looks like some donkey signatures on the bottom, so you'll you enjoy that. And then we have, of course, this, and it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, and then a plant for you. But thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. You've gone above and beyond. You've served as an executive committee member for so many years, and you do a great job. So we really appreciate it. Okay. Linda, you can stay up there. Yes, because I'm going to call four is... board members up to the podium now so I can swear you in. So, Linda, Michelle, Twin, and Gabriella, could you come up, please? So, these four board members were recently, actually, they, they all did their due diligence, filled out the paperwork, signed up to be a board member, and were ready to campaign, and then nobody ran against them. <laughs> so we've already certified the election at a prior board meeting that they are now uh, going to be on the board for four years. So we're really happy to have three incumbents return and to have Gabriella join us in Enrique's place as a new board member. So thank you all so much for your willingness to serve for four years on the school board. So I'm now going to swear you in. Let's see if that works. All right, please raise your right hand. When I say I, then you're gonna say your own name. I <laughs> do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Merry Christmas. Thank you, Debbie. down to item 4D, election of board president. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. There it is. yes. Um, I will entertain uh, nominations. I'm not looking at you, Mr. Pace. I'm. <laughs> I, 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 I was the first. You, you raise your hand, but you need to recognize first. <laughs> oh, there, said, there, there, therefore, I nominate uh, Linda Pacino as service president. Uh, this is a great job last year. Uh, I'll second that. There you go. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Um, opposed? What was that about uh, mental reservation? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I need to move this because I can't see. Okay, and election of board vice president. I would nominate Mr. Pace because he did a stellar job last year as well. And I second that nomination. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. An appointment of secretary to the board. I think Debbie could do that. <laughs> I, I can understand that. <laughs> I order Debbie to do that. <laughs> do we have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion mm -hmm. carries, Dr. Flores. All right, 4G, proposed 2023 board meeting calendar. This is an action item. Are there any comments or questions on the calendar? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Mr. Schultz. Oh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. And item 4H is a discussion item. And um, I, uh, usually take to the executive committee your uh, requests for assignment. So I would um, ask that you take a look at um, our assignments for 2022 and get your requests to me um, <laughs> by the end of next week. What is next Friday? 23rd? Oh, God, yeah. please get it to me before Christmas because you won't do anything after that. And uh, I'll take a look at it. And, and we have an exec committee meeting on the 4th, which I have to miss. Um, but that will be discussed. And we will certainly have it ready uh, by the meeting of January 12th. Any questions on that? OK. So um, get your requests in. And you all know um, Gabby is new. But uh, there's no guarantee that you'll get your request. So, um, but we will all do our best to do that. So, 4-H. Uh, now we go back to our regular board meeting. And we have our, our <coughs> report from our student board rep, Abigail Emerson from Gary High. Good evening, Superintendent Flores and board, board trustees, and thank you for having me. Tonight, I have updates from Gilroy High School as well as El Roble Elementary School. Um, starting off, so our first uh, big event of second quarter, we had our homecoming week. So to begin our homecoming week, we started float building two weeks uh, prior. 
this was our first time ever starting um, our float building two weeks in advance so that our class floats looked really amazing. And we had a ton of student participation in this and um, it was super fun. And then um, on homecoming week, we had a couple of spirit days. Um, one of them was a white lie day where students would wear white shirts and write a little white lie on them. And then we also had a throwback day where students could either uh, dress as their younger selves or as if they were from a past decade. Um, on homecoming day, our first event of the day was our rally. Um, we had a ton of themes and events and it was our second rally of the year. And one of my favorite things about the rally was watching some of our staff perform with our cheerleaders. Um, and then next, uh, students got released a little bit early. We got, uh, we got released at three o'clock to watch our annual homecoming parade. Uh, the parade featured all of our class floats as well as our homecoming royalty nominees riding convertibles, a football float and a cheerleader float. Um, a ton of the community turned out and it was super uh, cool to see all the floats. And then um, right after, or a little bit later in the day, we had our game against Independence High. Um, during our halftime, we announced uh, the homecoming royalty winners, as well as the class float winner. And um, we had our fireworks show, show during uh, halftime. And then right after the game, we got straight into the dance. Uh, for the dance, we had a theme of Old California, and it was more casual, and it was such a good time. We had um, mini golf, hula hooping, food, uh, the, a photo booth, and a DJ, and it was super fun. So next, we had a motivational speaker um, named Monty Washington. So originally me, as well as uh, some of the other ASD officers had the opportunity to watch him speak at the CATA leadership camp. Um, and when we watched him, we kind of immediately knew that we wanted him to speak at our school. It, we felt that his words would really relate to the students at our school. And he actually also spoke at Christopher High as well. Um, hearing him speak even for the second time was so amazing, his words, really like moved me and um, the students really enjoyed it. And some students even stayed after and got photos with him and got autographs from him. And as he was leaving the campus, uh, students were chanting his name. So he was very loved by our students. Next, we had our week of thanks spirit, uh, spirit week. This was the week leading up to our Thanksgiving break. Um, students this week, uh, we really wanted to take this week and appreciate the students and staff on our campus. Um, so one of the things that we did is we had some of our ASD students pass out little positive message notes uh, to students as they were walking on campus just to brighten up their day a little. And then um, at an, on another day during lunch, students had the opportunity to write thank you letters to their teachers, which the teachers really loved. And then we had some spirit days that week. We had a flannel versus cardigan day. And then we also had a holiday Scrabble day where students would wear uh, shirts with their friends with letters and spell out a word. So next we had our Rock the Mock event. Um, this was an opportunity for students to prepare for interview, uh, real interviews as they go into careers and more. Um, this was a really engaging and fun event. Um, I learned a lot from it as well as other students. We had a mock, we had mock interviews and a handshake workshop. We also had a keynote speaker and we had multiple presentations and one of them included a just to impress. So next we had our second dance of the year, which was our winter gala dance. Um, this dance was super fun. Uh, it was more formal, so students would wear suits and ties and dresses. Um, we, it was super energetic and students couldn't leave the dance floor. Uh, we had a DJ, we had a food cater from Old City Hall and we had a balloon drop at the end of the dance. But um, something that I really wanted to highlight about this dance was how much student effort it took to put on. We put on this dance in about two days. So that means that the students during their ASD class time worked to make decorations, spent the day talking about the dance and promoting it. And we that resulted in a super large uh, student turnout and students, once again, they loved it. And then um, 
also after the dance, you know, the cleanup process was amazing to see. You know, almost the second the uh, music turned off and the lights went on, students got right to work cleaning up. And even non-ASD students stayed and helped and cleaned up. And we were all out of there in about a half an hour. And it's efforts like these that make it so we are able to put on these events. And it's really, it was just amazing to see. Um, Next, we had our door decorating contest. So starting on November 28th, students and teachers had the opportunity to decorate their classroom doors. Um, they were super creative, and one class even uh, sang a carol for us. <laughs> um, next, uh, so we are getting really excited for the holidays. So we have had a couple of winter spirit days and activities. Last week, we had an ugly Christmas sweater day. And then this week on Wednesday during brunch, Santa Claus came to our school and passed out candy canes to students. And after school that day, students had the opportunity to decorate gingerbread cookies, and they, we had Kwanzaa and Hanukkah crafts. Uh, moving on to El Roble. So El Roble this year is doing their stream projects. TK, uh, TK through fifth grade has the opportunity to participate in them every month. Um, STREAM stands for S stands for science, T stands for technology, R stands for reading, E for engineering, and then they just added the A this year, which stands for art and math, and they do engineering crafts and labs. And then this is just another picture of them. And then on October 28th, El Roble hosted their Trunk or Tree as well as their Fall Festival. So the Trunk or Tree was, um, they had a bunch of cars lined up right out in front of the school and the cars were decorated and they had candy and the students were able to trick or treat out of the car trunks. And then they, like I said, they have their Fall Festival the same night. Uh, there was a large student turnout and all the students were dressed in their Halloween costumes and they had jump houses, they had games and food. Um, next, El Roble hosted their Scholastic Book Fair. This lasted a week and students had a wide variety of books to choose from. Um, next, El Roble ha just had their Christmas trees and treats on December 9th. Um, so teachers were given donated real trees um, and each uh, teacher in class had an opportunity to decorate their tree and students made ornaments. And this was a night dedicated to walking around and seeing those trees. And there was um, hot chocolate and cookies and even a story time from their principal, Miss X. And then these past weeks, um, El Roble has been hosting a toy and pajama drive. So right outside the school, they have a bin where uh, families can donate toys and pajamas. And they are partnering with Kinship Adoption Foster Care Association to donate these toys and pajamas to foster children. And that is all, all I have. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. And our next uh, report is the superintendent's report. Dr. Flores. Thank you. Before I begin my regular superintendent's report, I want to uh, say a few words about two special people. One, I want to acknowledge the passing of Don Christopher on Monday afternoon. We were all just so sad to hear that Don had passed away. He has had such an amazing influence on our district. I, I, I don't have time tonight. I hope at some point that we can acknowledge all the wonderful things that Don has done for our district. The list is just so long. His generosity is unmatched. I've never met anybody who's so giving and so caring about our district. So I just wanted to acknowledge Don just for a moment because he's impacted so many of our lives in so many positive ways. The second recognition I want to make this evening is, and I'm indulging myself, we don't normally talk about people that are retiring at a board meeting, but I'm going to <laughs> uh, because um, this is a member of my cabinet and I know I'm gonna embarrass Kathleen a little bit, but Kathleen, why don't you stand up? <laughs> <laughs> this is Kathleen's last board meeting uh, before she retires at the end of the month. Why isn't she jumping up and down? <laughs> Yeah, really, it's your last board meeting, Kathleen. Um, 
I'm sure she's attended hundreds of board meetings in her 13 years as a member of my cabinet in the role of director of elementary curriculum and instruction. She is the longest serving member of my cabinet. She came to our district with a wealth of experiences which has served us well. She was a teacher, a resource specialist, director of special ed, elementary principal, assistant superintendent of elementary ed before she even came to our district. So she had so many experiences that really helped her fill the role in our district and it was a new role. It was a, a new model that I recommended to the board. Kathleen is a dedicated, hardworking, innovative leader who cares deeply about the staff and the students in our district. She's always prepared and she does her homework. She goes above and beyond and often volunteers to take on a task. She's a problem solver and looks for the positives in every situation. She has a very special relationship with the elementary principals and she does everything she can to support them. As a member of cabinet, I appreciate her contributions over so many years now and her contributions to the very intense sometimes discussions in cabinet. She's always very balanced and thoughtful about her contributions and she, um, I can depend on her to carry out the decisions that we make in our group. During the pandemic, Kathleen worked relentlessly to provide support to principals and staff during those very trying times. Kathleen, much more will be said about you at the retirement dinner in May, but I wanted to acknowledge your service as a member of our cabinet at your last board meeting in our district. You have no, no doubt done so many things that I'm not even aware of, but the no things I know about, I will be eternally grateful to you for everything you've done. And we wish you a great retirement and we hope that you will spend it doing all those things you've been dreaming about doing uh, during your very long career in public education. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Thank you. I'll give my uh, regular report as quickly as possible because we're already behind on Lucy's time schedule. Um, well, as already was mentioned, we had Rock the Mock at Gory High and both Gory High and Gekka students uh, participated that day. We had a wonderful showing from the business community and other uh, people in our community that agreed to be interviewers that day. You're, you're seeing a couple of them right there. It was a very successful event. We received excellent feedback from the students. They really value the Mock the Rock experience. Uh, the same day we had District Office Spirit Day, which I didn't even get to participate in because I never made it back here. I was at the fence all day, but it was a fun day as other people told me. At this time of year, um, as you know, the Chamber of Commerce selects the man of the year, the woman of the year, and the educator of the year. And they also select the student, Su Susan Valenti Youth Leadership Award uh, awardee. And I was very pleased that afternoon to be able to go over with Mark Turner and recognize a, a, a Alexandra Bayret a GECA student, and she's also our student board rep. So she's uh, going to be honored at the Chamber's event. And then 10 days later, we were able to go over to Glenview and recognize just an amazing, amazing first grade teacher, Michelle Anderson. Her son came over and of course the principal was there, Mark and I, and she was totally surprised. She had no idea this was coming. So she is our educator of the year. Uh, Four board members and I attended the California School Board Association Conference in San Diego. And unfortunately, a couple of us got sick uh, as a result of the conference, but it was a great conference. Lots of uh, valuable workshops, a really good networking, and we got to see some of our, the companies that we contract with. It was really well done. It was the first time we'd been in three years. You went last year, that's right. The rest of us didn't. Okay, and then that same day, unfortunately, uh, I always miss the holiday parade because I'm at the CSBA event. Last year I didn't go, so I got to go to the holiday parade. I just can't be at two places at once, but it was cool to see Alexandra recognized on the side of our buses, which always, one of our buses always participates in the, uh, the holiday parade. 
And uh, last week we had the South Valley Middle School topping out ceremony, which unfortunately I missed because I was sick. Um, but it sounded like a great event where board members and staff signed a beam that will eventually not be uh, visible to anybody, but it'll be part of the uh, one of the largest structures at South Valley, and you may hear more about that later. And then Friday we had our facilities subcommittee, and there was a tour uh, before that uh, to the site, to South Valley, to see the construction, which is just amazing what's happening right now with the largest building. And then they went over to Luigi to see the new playground, which is really coming along. It'll be done when the students come back in January. And then uh, they visited a potential location for this, a new location for the Swanson Preschool. And then Monday night, I had a SPAC meeting. All my meetings uh, over last week were virtual, unfortunately, because I was sick. Thankfully, we know how to do that very well now. <laughs> so I uh, did a lot of meetings last week from my home, including the SPAC meeting, which was well attended. We had most of our school sites represented at the, at the meeting, and Alvo Mesa came and spoke about some issues that they'd requested to address. And then Tuesday, we had a Rock the Mock debrief, which we do every year while it's fresh in our mind, how we can improve it. And then we had a district office spirit day this week. Do we have a picture? <coughs> I'm going to have to stop. Otherwise, I'm going to start coughing. Sorry. So can we just flip to the next one, Melanie, so everybody can see what's coming up? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, item eight, consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion. Student approval. It's Melissa, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 9A, this is an action item. Accept the 2021-22 audit report. Mr. Mess. Good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent and members of the public. Um, tonight, we have uh, J Mr. Jesse Doyle, who's a partner from James Marta and Company, uh, who you've met before, joining us virtually. Um, and he will present uh, the audit, financial audit for 21-22, as well as the Measure T audit, which is the general obligation bond, and the general obligation audit for Measure E as well. Um, Jesse, are you online? Unmute myself. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, Jesse, go ahead. And can you see my screen? Uh, please go on presentation mode. But yes, we can see your uh, presentation. And we lost it now. There we go. We can see it now. And you're good on presentation you can see mode. All righty. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My name is Jesse Deal. I'm going to be presenting the audit results for the district audit first, and then I'll go into measure E and P, bond audit and performance. So the first uh, item of communication is the governance letter. That's just the auditor communication uh, with the board. Talks about the nature, timing, and extent of the audit process. And if there's any difficulties or any new pronouncements that are uh, involved in the uh, audit, and then we have the the actual audit report, and then within the audit report, you have the internal control letter, and the state compliance audit letter, and the federal compliance audit letter, and I'll go over the results of all of those here in a second. And so we were engaged to perform the financial statement audit that includes the governmental activities, the governmental funds, the aggregate remaining funds that you'll see uh, in the supplementary section, and then you have the notes to the financial statements that basically uh, go into detail of the uh, financial statements, the, the significant accounts. Then we have the required supplementary information uh, and then the supplementary information. So that's a layout of the actual audit report. And I'll move into the governance letter in more detail. So the biggest thing you want to take away from the governance letter uh, is the audit opinion. We issued an unmodified opinion. And that basically means you have a clean audit. It's the best opinion an auditor can provide. And that basically means that the financial statements were fairly stated as of 
June 30th, 2022, and they were in conformity with the appropriate accounting standards. And so we worked closely with the district management team. Uh, we performed inquiries, uh, talked about the scope of the audit and when we would come out and do the audit procedures during interim and year end. And so we did not have to have any additional consultations. We did not have any disagreements or difficulties uh, encountered during the course of the audit. And we did obtain the appropriate representations from management that all the information that was provided to us was true and accurate uh, to their knowledge. And we were able to uh, basically uh, gather the audit evidence and form our basis for the opinion. And so uh, the other thing that's called out in the governance letter are any estimates. So the net pension liability is based off an estimate. We're using the actuarial valuations that are available to us. And then we looked at the methodology for the collectible receivables. And so no issues noted there. We uh, were comfortable with the uh, actual evaluations and ma uh, management uh, methodology for the uh, booking of the receivables. And so during the course of the audit, we did uh, test controls. Uh, so we gathered uh, the policies and procedures and then basically uh, made sure that what management was telling us that they actually performed during uh, the course of uh, the business, uh, they actually do those and, and basically no issues were noted there. And so I'll summarize the results in just a moment. Uh, all in all, uh, no issues were noted. Everything went as planned. Uh, no significant adjustments or disclosures that were omitted. So everything that you have in front of you is complete and accurate. And now I'm gonna get into the actual audit report. So the opinion that I let off with is found on pages one through three. And again, it's an unmodified opinion. Following the audit opinion is the management discussion and analysis found on pages four through 13. And so this is a cliff note uh, version, the summary of the entire audit report. So if you don't wanna read the entire 80 plus page audit report, I do encourage you to read this. I did pull some items out of there uh, to bring to your attention. And so first thing I wanted to pull out was the statement of, of net position. So this is a comparison uh, balance sheet, if you will. This includes the governmental activity uh, along with the items that are uh, long-term in nature. So capital assets and long-term liabilities are included in the governmental activity. And so all in all, you'll see total assets increased by 2.6 million from the year prior. Uh, and then we had deferred outflows that decreased by 1.2 million. Uh, liabilities were uh, down 73.2 million. At, and then deferred inflows increased by 34.5 million and net position uh, increased by 40 million. And so how we got there, this is in, in a visual representation. And so you'll see the total assets at the top there uh, just a 0.4% increase from the year prior. And then the deferred um, uh, outflow decrease is primarily due to deferred loss on refunding. So we're actually saving some money, uh, but we actually get the, uh, the benefit in the future. And that's why it's called a deferred uh, outflow uh, from that refunding transaction. Uh, and then looking at the total liabilities, we had a su substantial decrease. Majority of that decrease is from the net pension uh, liability. And so one thing I wanted to uh, uh, talk about in regards to the net pension liability, we're using the actuarial valuations from 2021 because those are the most recent ones available to us. The results from the June 30th, 2022 net pension uh, from STRS and PERS is not gonna be available until uh, between March and May of 2023. So uh, the biggest thing you wanna take away from this is in 2021, the economic environment, the markets were in, in a, uh, a lot better condition as they are right now. And so because of that, the, the assets in those uh, pension plans were inflated. And so we actually got to benefit from that by recognizing a smaller liability 
than what we will next year, uh, because as of uh, June 30th, 2022, we are between the 20 and 25 percent decrease in the uh, market. So uh, just wanted to point that out. So expectation from next year is to see a, a swing in the opposite direction with the long term liabilities, especially with the uh, net pension liability. Then focusing on the, the deferred inflows, you can see the uh, pension related inflow was the huge uh, increase. So the, the benefits that you're getting, you can't recognize them right away. So there it's being deferred. So you can kind of see the, the relationship there. And again, that's all actuarial uh, 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 factored. So they, they determine it using the assumptions. And then uh, this is how we ended up with the total net position of 134 point, almost 6 million. Now focusing on the statement of activities. So this is the government wide income statement, if you will. And you'll see revenues were down uh, slightly uh, by 1.4 million, uh, but expenses were down 29 million. And that's uh, kind of how we have the uh, change in net position by 28 million. And so this is the actual uh, visual representation of the statement of activity. Now, because of that pension um, decrease, that actually gets uh, flushed through the expenses. And because they're uh, uh, instruction and pupil related, uh, that's the reason why you see that decrease um, affect those those line items there at, at the the top the top three factors in the red box there. So next year, you're going to see a, a larger swing uh, because of the increase. But you'll see total revenues. We had 185.1 million. And then uh, total expenditures, uh, we had 145 million. And that's how we have that change in that position of 40 million. Now, focusing on the general fund revenue. So this is actually what transpires during the 12 months. Uh, the other items that I... Uh, I was showing you compiles all the long-term assets and liabilities. So now when we're focusing on the general fund revenues, you'll see uh, that we have 70, almost 78% um, uh, of our revenues coming from local control funding formula. And a large part of that formula uh, is the uh, average daily attendance, the ADA. So, um, just be mindful um, when we're looking at budgeting for the future. Um, so that LCFF uh, of 78%, that's 118 million of your total revenue. Then we have federal revenues of 6.8%, which is 10.3 million. And then we have state uh, revenue of 18.3 million and local revenue of 4.8 million. Looking at the, the expenses from the general fund. So this is where you'll see uh, the majority of the, the expenses are uh, certificated, uh, classified salaries, and then the related benefits. So certificated salaries were uh, um, 60 million, and then classified were uh, 19.3 million, and benefits were 34.6 million. And then we did have some uh, supplies expense of 10.6 million, and other services of 21.5 million. Now, focusing on the trends and analysis, so this is one of the supplementary uh, schedules uh, towards the end of the audit report. I like to show this, so it focuses on the general fund. Uh, and so you have a two-year look back, and then you have the current year of audit, and then uh, as of the adopted budget. So uh, focusing on the middle of the screen there, you'll see the change in fund balance. We've had surpluses in the last three years. However, we are budgeting for a deficit. Um, and this is as of the adopted budget. So Alvaro may have had other presentations uh, where things may have changed since uh, September, uh, but this is the information that we had available at the time of the audit. And uh, the district is well positioned um, uh, currently. Uh, they're doing a great job with managing their, their finances. You'll see at the bottom available resources as a percentage of total outgo. So Typically, district this size is between five and seven percent. You guys are uh, at ten 
uh, as of the, the year of audit, uh, but your projection is 21.4%. So that's, that's good news, especially uh, heading into a recession. And then you'll see the long-term debt at the bottom there. You'll see we had a significant decrease. Again, majority of that decrease is due to the pension liability decreasing. And then you can see the uh, uh, average daily attendance at the bottom. And you'll see that we've actually been declining uh, over the last couple of years. So just be mindful when we're doing the uh, budgeting process. And this is a visual representation of the ADA over the last few years. And then along with the audit report, there are other uh, communications as I led off with. So we have the independent auditors report on compliance with state laws and regulations, so the state compliance audit. As you can see here, no matters were reported, so an unmodified opinion uh, with the state compliance audit, uh, so no findings there. The report on internal control, that basically uh, looks at the uh, business office and, and their processes that they have in place, and uh, if there's adequate segregation of duties, so checks and balances, uh, so no matters were reported here. So that basically means there's no segregation of uh, or significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. So good news there. And then uh, we had the federal audit. So anytime a governmental agency uh, receives and spends over 750,000 in federal uh, funding, uh, it triggers what they call a single audit, uh, a federal compliance audit. And so we performed uh, a single audit for the district. And we uh, basically uh, issued an unmodified opinion on the federal programs that we audited. And then another component is that uh, to check the internal controls over those federal uh, programs. And we did not identify any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. So all in all, a clean sweep. You had uh, a clean audit. And this is the, the results that you would want uh, as a board and as a community. Um, again, the financial condition of the district has been improving. Uh, we did have uh, a great results there. Uh, and again, it's because of your management team, you guys are making uh, sound decisions. And with that, I wanted to thank Kimberly, Alvaro, Anna, uh, Irma, and the rest of the district staff for all their hard work and assistance with the audit process. I'll leave it up to you guys for any questions before I get into the bond uh, measure EMP performance and financial results. Trustees, any questions? I like that there are no questions because there was nothing reported. Well done. No findings for no the findings. fourth year in a row. And uh, I want to thank, uh, of course, Kimberly Mason, our director, Irma, and Anna O'Connor, who are all here. And Jesse, thank you. Uh, your team was phenomenal, not just during the audit, but during the entire year when we have questions. The reason, board, why we don't typically have audit findings is because of our great partnership with the auditors, and we pick their brains throughout the year. So it, it's not an accident. Thank you, Jesse. It's also not an accident in our... Um how we, You're very welcome. How we do our finances. Um, many years, many, many years, I remember um, issues about ASB. And Any other questions before I move on to the, that's okay. the next presentation? That's it. No. Can, can you hear our board president when she's speaking, Jesse? Just a question. No, I can only hear you, Alvaro. That's probably a good thing. Uh, Go ahead. Our apologies. That, that, that figures. You just told us about your special relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I think they're ready for the bond. I, I, actually, I actually heard that. So I think it's probably with the mic. If you want to speak it to the mic, I think it picks up on the volume. Okay. We're ready for the, for the bond one. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to summarize the audit results for measures P and E. So we performed a uh, bond financial and performance audit. So I won't go into the background. You guys are aware that we've issued a number of bonds and they triggered a bond financial and performance audit. Uh, focusing on measure P, 
uh, we have Series A, B, and C. Uh, so a total of 150 million uh, bonds were sold. And focusing on Measure E, we have Series 2017, Series 2019, and Series 2021 for a total of 170 million of authorization. And so there is a communication with the uh, governance. So that's the communication from the auditor with the board. And again, just like with the other presentation, uh, it's our communication to let you know what the audit opinion is, if there was any difficulties encountered during the course of the audit, if there's any additional consultations, and if we uh, basically received the management representations. And so we did not ident identify any issues or difficulties, no disagreements. We did not have the need to consult with any other uh, accountants or professionals. Uh, we did obtain the management representation uh, in time. Uh, all the information was true and accurate to their uh, knowledge. And uh, we were able to form our basis for our audit opinion. Uh, there were no significant estimates in the bond uh, financial audit. And typically, you do not uh, see those types of items. It's, it's pretty straightforward with cash, maybe some accounts receivable. And if you see accounts table, it's usually just the timing of when the invoices come in. And uh, we did test uh, the controls. We looked at the contracts. Uh, usually, the risk with bond audits uh, and, and bond uh, proceeds in general, uh, the risk is with uh, vendors and, and conflicts of interest. And, uh, and usually with change orders. So we uh, looked at the bidding process and anytime there was a change order, we looked at the district uh, protocols, policies and procedures and ensured that they were followed at all times. So no issues were noted during the course of uh, the audits for the, the bond proceeds. Uh, to summarize the results, uh, everything went as planned no findings, no issues noted. Uh, all the information that needed to be disclosed uh, was disclosed. So those uh, bond audit reports in front of you are complete and accurate as of June 30th, uh, 2022. Now focusing actually on the uh, audit report, pages one through three will have our audit opinion. We issued an unmodified opinion on the financial statement. And then I wanted to present both of them simultaneously side by side uh, for the interest of time. Measure P and E are listed here and you'll see total assets for measure P. We ended with 1.6 million. Measure E ended with 73.1 million. And then uh, focusing on the uh, liabilities, you'll see uh, it was a, a small invoices uh, for measure P. $2,900 there, and then $23,379 for Measure E. And then you'll see at the bottom, the fund balance is 100% restricted for Measure P and E. So these funds cannot be spent uh, by any other uh, fund at the district. They have to remain in the building fund. And then within the building fund, they have separate resources set up uh, to track the bond measure separately. And so we verified that, and that's how we were able to compile the financial statement. And then looking at the uh, income statement for both Measure P and E, I uh, wanted to uh, briefly tell you that the revenues on bond proceeds, it's usually just the interest uh, accumulated, interest earnings on the unspent funds. So there was uh, less uh, cash during the course of the year uh, in Measure P, so it earned less interest. Uh, however, it did earn interest of $15,373. Uh, measure E had the bulk of it, um, and so it earned $741,736. And this has to be uh, in the uh, building uh, and bond funds. It cannot be used for any other purpose, so it gets to actually help out uh, and uh, be spent on the approved uh, projects. And so you'll see the total expenditures there, 
775,757 for measure P, and then measure E, we had 35.6 million there. And so we've tested over 80% uh, uh, on each of these bond measures, just to give you peace of mind, uh, knowing that the district is spending the funds appropriately. And then you'll see the beginning fund balance uh, uh, where we started off with on July 1st, 2021, and then where we ended. Um, and again, the ending fund balance is restricted for these uh, measures and they cannot be spent for any other purpose. And so with the performance audit, uh, it's basically we have to test those transactions and compare them to the bond measure text. They have to uh, be 100% uh, in line with the text. Um, and so we were able to uh, make sure that the district does have a separate uh, system to track uh, and allocate these uh, expen expen expenditures. And uh, we looked at the expenditures between July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. Uh, we did not identify any misappropriation and we were able to conclude and issue an unmodified opinion on the performance audit. And so, I led off with the audit opinion on the bond financial audit, and then I gave you the results on the bond performance audit, uh, both unmodified opinions, and then there is a re uh, internal control report uh, that we have to issue, and that it talks about the, the controls that the district has in place, and no matters came to our attention, no deficiencies were noted, so no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, so good job there. Again, clean sweep. Uh, the district is spending the funds in accordance with the provisions of Measure P and Measure E. And again, we wanted to thank uh, Kimberly, Albro, uh, Anna, and Irma, and the rest of the district staff for their hard work. So these are smaller audits than the district audit, but it, it is a lot of work. And they've done a great job with providing us with all the support in a timely manner. And so with that, I wanted to thank them for their efforts. And, uh, and I'll leave it up to you guys for any questions on the bond financial and performance audits. Board, any questions, board members? Mr. Mesa, I have one question, which is you have, you show books and supplies out of both um, P and E. Can you explain what books and supplies? Um, so Alvaro, if you're saying something, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, the, the question from our board president was, we are showing entries related to books and supplies on both measure P and E, but clearly those are not books and supplies. Those are just materials for the, the building that aren't classified as professional services or capital outlay. It's just the standard SACS default um, for object funds. Exactly, it is the standard SACS default. So that's what we have to present on the financials, but it's really uh, supplies. Thank you. I, no more questions? Nope. This is an action item. Were there any other questions? No, Jesse, thank you. Okay, thank you. I move approval and accept the, the uh, audit reports. This is Quinn, I, I, I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. We will go on to item 9E. Recall that we made that change in the agenda. This is the annual update to 10-year enrollment projections. This is an information item. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, board. Good evening, Superintendent. Again, I'm pleased to present uh, to you, uh, you'll remember Ron Van Orden from uh, Decision Insight. Um, he's been with us before. Uh, tonight, he will present the update uh, to the 10-year enrollment projection. So just for the public uh, and the benefit of the public, we annually uh, update our enrollment projections, and they're done in a 10-year horizon. So uh, it is important for us to reevaluate what's going on with the residential development, uh, our own birth uh, accounts uh, in the city, and as well as taking into account any um, actual occupancy from the city. So our Consultants uh, definitely work closely with the city to get a better understanding of how that is all working. Uh, Mr. Ron, thank you for being here with us. 
Good evening, uh, Board of Education, Superintendent Flores. Great to be back with you in person. Um, I, a little bit, uh, this is what I'll take you through uh, this evening. Here's our agenda. A um, little bit about us. Um, we used to be called Decision Insight. We are now part of Power School. Um, and it's a little bit about me. Um, tonight, what I wanted to do is to unpack a little bit of the larger demographic factors that are influencing and impacting K-12 education. Um, one of the things that the California Department of Finance has put out recently is that by the year 2030, they are projecting 11% fewer public K-12 students in the state. So a lot of our clients are asking, you know, what's going on? So a few pieces to just unpack. Uh, first off, you have um, these three bullets you see here are some of the larger demographic forces at work at a national level. The first one is something called generational time. And that's the average age of the, when a mother has their first child. In 1970, that was 21 years. And again, these are averages. And in 2022, that's increased to 30 years. So what we're seeing is really a lengthening of time between when people start families. Second, you have uh, fertility rates. Uh, often called live births, but the technical term is fertility rates. Um, the total fertility rate peaked in the year 2000, and the estimate for 2022 is 1.63. A uh, TFR of 2.1 is considered by experts to be needed to just maintain population and not have population decline. So the third factor is really the one that impacts school district, which is net migration. That is the total number of persons uh, that move to an area compared to how many people leave. And if you have more people moving into an area, you, the population rises. So here's a graph. Um, this is the percent of growth of the state of California, the population both going back to 1950 and some projected data. So very clear uh, trend. Uh, you have 1950 to 1960, really the boom time of California, rapid expansion, almost a 50% growth in population, people moving to the state. And that has steadily declined. And after the 2020 census, there's projecting that we might even reach stasis or even have population decline in the state of California. As I mentioned before, the California Department of Finance is projecting an 11% decline across the state at the state level. This graph here is showing that that, uh, that decline will not be uniform across the state. Uh, there's just some selected areas, but you can see some of the areas like Los Angeles, Ventura, Santa Clara, very low on that area, and some areas really about just a percentage point or two decline. And that's really because of net migration. You have some more built out areas, more urbanized areas where there's really no room for expansion. Um, and you have some areas where there is room for expansion, which means there could be a net increase in the housing stock, allowing people to move to that area. So we're going through all this because as you go from a national level to a state level, and then ultimately down to a district level, uh, the big factor, the big thing we look at is the net increase in housing because that is an indicator that people can move to the area and that population can grow. The reason we're kind of highlighting this this year is that the new housing research we complete is done in the summer, uh, typically in July and August. And since then, we've seen a dramatic rise in interest rates. And what we're expecting is a slowdown in the growth of new housing. So I wanted to provide that context to the, uh, to the board because as you look at our projections, um, it's important that you know that that was a snapshot in time. And as you look at those housing growth, uh, the housing numbers, that there could be a potential slowdown or a lengthening um, or a pushing out of some of the phasing of some of those projects. So let me just pause there and see if there's any questions before we dig into the numbers. Does that all make sense? Okay, so 
digging into our numbers, um, you'll see housing, the housing market, the increase in uh, impact of new residential development. But the other things we do look at is how many kindergarten uh, students you are enrolling compared to how many uh, students are exiting at 12th grade. Uh, and how those students age through your system in terms of retain, uh, how many you retain, and then inter and intra-district transfers. Students that might be uh, transferring into your district that reside outside of your district and also within your district. TK expansion also um, is modeled in our forecast. So as the eligibility increases for the program, we are modeling that that will be a uh, net increase. As I mentioned before, we produce a uh, conservative forecast and a moderate. Really the only differences are some slight algorithmic, algorithmic differences in the two. Uh, you have the moderate is always gonna generate the greatest number of students while the conservative will generate the fewest. And we also do take a more conservative approach with the new housing research in the conservative forecast. Typically we push some of those projects out in time a little bit to account for delays and slowdowns. This first part, we're gonna look at uh, some of your history, recent four-year history. And this graph here is showing the difference in, between today and four years ago. So the easiest way I can explain this is if you had 100 kindergarten students four years ago, today you have 84. Um, and that is true of the grade bands K-5, 6 through 8, and grades 9 through 12. Interestingly, compared to four years ago, you have slightly more 9th through, through 12th graders, but as a district, you're at 93%. This is similar to that uh, graph I just showed you, except it's looking year to year. Uh, kindergarten, obviously from 2020 to 2021, you do have an increase, uh, largely uh, attributed to the pandemic. Um, that was true of, uh, we work with about almost 150 districts in the state, and nearly all of them saw that kind of phenomenon where students during that pandemic year, during remote learning, some kindergartners just uh, did not enroll or did not participate that year. These are some of the cohort changes. So again, we're looking for the students as they matriculate from K to first, first to second, second to third. And what we're really looking for here are any significant things that stand out. Um, one thing growing from grade eight to nine, you have a 116%, which is significant. Um, and that is again, not terribly unusual if you have areas where um, there are maybe other options K through eight. Some of those students do come in at the ninth grade high school level. Um, but really, we're looking at how many students you're retaining as they matriculate through um, the district. So new housing, and uh, this year, and we expect over the next few years, new housing development is going to be a key thing that we're looking at, um, looking at substantial changes. Um, everything we're hearing is that what is not expected is a significant crash like we experienced in the mid-2000s. But there is obviously some softening. And in our experience, having worked uh, for nearly 20 years, is that we find that developers slow down the pace of development because ultimately they want to build homes and then be able to sell them. They don't want to uh, build them and not be able to sell them in a rapid fashion. So what we do is we will contact the city, the county uh, developers directly. We get phasing. We get the type of housing that is being built. Uh, price point uh, and the phasing, as well as the total number of units. Here is a look at the projects, uh, the type of housing that is being built or is proposed to be built. And the graph as it goes to the right is the total number of units they expect to sell um, in that school year. So the years across the top are always going to be the fall of the school year. So 25 would be the 25-26 school year. And this is uh, 
we, we do this because we want to know when the district can expect to see the impact of those students. Again, this is conservative, so we do tend to temper what developers tell us directly. In our experience, developers are pretty aggressive, and there's always slowdowns and delays, uh, especially with some of the uh, supply chain issues they're having these days. Uh, this is just a graph of that previous chart showing the total number of units and the year. Uh, the two colors do represent how we temper some of that. Um, again, it's not a dramatic difference, but it, they are slightly different. We do map all of the developments that are happening, largely so at a school level. We know which schools will be impacted by the new housing. So that's just a look at some of those developments mapped. And here uh, are the rates that we then apply to those units. So uh, we uh, this is just here really for your reference, so you know that the rates that we've used. These are the same rates we've used historically. And so now we have students. Again, moderate on top, conservative uh, below. You'll see, again, the number of students expected to be generated by new housing. Uh, and then the year. The aggregate totals those up over the 10-year uh, forecast, so you can get a sense of how many students you can expect from new housing. The reason, again, the conservative is a slightly less than the moderate is because we do tend to push out some of those projects, so some go beyond the 10-year time horizon. It seems strange to me that in 2025 that the conservative has a higher number than the moderate. Yeah, that might just, um, I don't know the exact answer to that, but that might just be that we pushed one project from the previous year into that second, or that later year. So here is a look at the conservative projection at a, a district level. Uh, again, totaled up. Our projections actually begin at each elementary level. We aggregate that up for your middle high and district wide. So every school has a projection just like this. Uh, the percentage change uh, all the way down the bottom there is the year-to-year -year percentage change. So uh, anything that stands out there, you can see that um, there is a fairly uh, steady decline. Uh, I would say that organically, if you removed new housing, every single district in the state would be declining because of those demographic factors. Some districts are growing, but that is only because they have uh, new development happening at such a scale that that is then causing them to grow. So it's not that there's more students, it's just the net migration and the housing that's occurring that is allowing their population to rise. Now jumping to the moderate. Again, the moderate is going to always generate the greatest number of students. So you'll see here that we still see some decline, albeit not as uh, significant as the conservative. These, uh, this is the two projections graphed, and our recommendation, again, for our clients is to use the conservative for your budget and staffing planning and moderate for facility planning. Um, and in, out at the 10-year time horizon, uh, you should expect your actuals to come in between, between those two. This is, again, uh, the conservative projection, except this now is broken out by the kindergarten, K-5, 6, 8, and 9, 12 bands, so you can get a sense of uh, the impact there at those different levels. And now we have the moderate projection. This graph, again, uh, I always take some mental gymnastics for me even sometimes. The, co the color now represents the time. So you're looking across the bottom there at the grade levels. The total number of students is in the vertical column. And the different color bands then represent uh, where those grade levels will be at a five-year future and at a 10-year future. 
And this graph is really designed to give visibility if there is any sort of significant large cohort that might be aging through your system. We've had clients with that phenomenon where they just happen to have two or three years, uh, a high number of students. That's one way to visualize that. The other one is to get a sense of maybe needs at different levels, middle, high, elementary, out into the future. It's just another way to look at some of those numbers. Questions? Questions, board members? Trustee Pace? You got any good news? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we do have um, some clients that are double digit, you know, it's towards that 15, 18, that they are experiencing that. And that really is a very uh, a profound difference. Um, we have a, when I started 12 years ago, um, as you mentioned, the peak was 2000, but we had a lot of districts growing. Now we're getting a lot more engagement around school consolidation and uh, the practicalities that do come with declining enrollment. So, um, unfortunately, no, I don't have, I don't have that. <laughs> any, any way to uh, have more students. Okay, thank you very much. Very informative, very depressing, but thank you. <laughs> it's good that we know what's coming. Yes. And we have Item 9B, first interim financial report for the 22-23 budget, and this is an action item. Thank you, Madam President. Once again, good evening. Um, I'll try to be brief, but still cover all the main topics. As, as you know, this is the first interim financial report, um, and this is one of those reports that requires a certification, a self-certification, which means we have staff review the finances, and then certify either positive, negative, or qualified, which is the types of certifications here that you see. Um, Gilroy Unified is, of course, self-certifying as positive. Positive means that we will meet our financial obligations for the current and subsequent two years. A qualified certification would mean that, you know, that third year out on the multi-year projection may or may not meet uh, the financial obligations and a negative certification uh, means that you have a cash situation in a dire straits uh, problem in a budget issue that is not a budgetary issue alone, but it involves cash as well. Uh, but again, G uh, our district is self-certifying as uh, positive, so we're in good shape. For the first time since I can remember, and really I think it's in the history of Gilroy Unified, uh, revenues have surpassed $200 million. Um, that's because we have a lot of one-time revenues that are in the budget, and you'll have a slide outlining what those are, amounts, et cetera, but it's just a significant, really historic amount of one-time revenue. This is the total general fund, so this is unrestricted and restricted, which obviously includes federal and state programs, uh, even donations, et cetera, but really by the most um, accounting, uh, it's just an extraordinary amount of one-time revenues. Please note that the Prop 98 um, whole slice of the pie is just not this 25% that says of CFF, that's the state part, but there's also education protection um, account that's about $22 million. At one point, it got to a $2 million, if you remember several years ago. That's important because as the state budget goes, as these uh, taxes go, that 22 million to us, to Gilroy Unified, used to be 2 million, so that means the state obligation, then the, its share reduces, right? Because the EPA is pulling, it's helping the state because of that taxes. Those are gonna set to expire, and then the state has to pony up the whole thing. And property taxes, of course, between the three categories, that's really the Prop 98 obligation, totaling 132 million or so uh, in total. Okay, there we go. I was getting a little nervous. It was freezing on me. And again, for the first time, it's 208, almost $9 million in total expenses. Again, and I, just a staggering number. And here's, I want to spend a little bit of time. When you have roughly $40 million of one-time expenditures built into the budget, 
one-time expenditures, we're not going to budget into salary and ongoing obligations. So when you add up certificated salaries, classified salaries, benefits, and, and, and all those things, uh, they're less than 59% because of the huge influx of one-time funds. Let's parse that out and say, look at the unrestricted general fund only, the operational piece of the budget. Then you end up getting about um, 83%. And then when you do the homework and you look into what was the carryover into the unrestricted general fund and exclude that because that's one time, again, in the unrestricted um, budget, then you have 88%. So 88% is the true uh, unrestricted share of the general fund budget that is already tied into salary and benefits. And that's obviously super important for us to note that. I can't advance the slides. Can you do that? It's either frozen or I can't do it. So, uh, and I'm getting a Microsoft PowerPoint is not responding on my screen. I am always cursed with these things. I was going to say. Um, anyway, the next slide uh, for the board members. There we go. Thank there you. Go. Um, it's the variance between the September uh, and revised uh, uh, in first interim. I'm sorry. And so what we're highlighting here is just really changes between when we closed the books, we also at the same time revised our current budget. And then this, this just highlights the difference. Significant uh, changes to revenue, significant changes to the expenditures. Why? We have over $21 million of one-time money that you're about to see. That's the highlight. And then obviously we had our um, big push of the year in the beginning to get those lunch applications in. I know parents, you're hearing me, thank you. I wanna thank you and our principals and our side-based folks for getting that in. Our assumption on the budget always starts at 58% uh, on duplicate account, meaning English language learners, foster youth, and uh, socially economic disadvantaged students make up about 58%. That's my based uh, assumption for every single year on the multi-year projection. This year, thanks to a lot of hardworking folks at the school sites, and thank you parents for sending that in, for those applications in online. We reached 59.97 or thereabouts. That's a big difference. That almost uh, generates $600,000 of concentration funds to the district that we are obligated to then send directly to the school sites, uh, to the school sites, a direct allocation. Uh, now the school principals will get a revised allocation um, pretty soon here. Um, and, and that'll all work out for this year. Um, but there again, that was a big difference, 600,000, but for the most part, um, it was that $21 million um, of, of one-time funds. This is the list of that overall. At, at, uh, this is the first center on a budget that includes all one-time revenues. We started with 39.8 million. That's just a staggering amount of one-time revenues. If you remember the uh, revenues on the budget, it's 201 million. So that's like 25% of one of, of, of the whole budget being one time. And there's a balance of about almost 35 million. And just between September and um, December, uh, we received 21 million. And the, the, the key ones that we want to highlight is those big ones, the uh, learning uh, recovery uh, emergency block grant. That alone was... 13.5 million, I can't see. <laughs> and then 6.3, almost 6.4 million on arts uh, music uh, block grant. This is the one-time arts and music block grant. It is not the Prop 28 that just passed. We still have not yet received that allocation. That starts the following year, of course. So again, just huge, significant one-time funding. Um, this is a new data point that I want to highlight for the board. The um, I can't see that piece because it's showing blue in my screen. But the California Health and Human Services, I believe that's the acronym, um, finally plotted the 2021 um, data point in November, just uh, a few weeks ago. And that was uh, um, 805 students. Th these are, I'm sorry, 805 births in our zip code, the not students, 805 births in our zip code. And so you can see from the prior trends, it goes up, it goes down, and basically we're kind of hovering around that same level. That's important because these um, births five years later become kinders, and you just heard Ron say that we're about 84 or whatever percent from uh, kinders from last year. Well, this 812 are, is our kinder um, class now, and our kinder class now is about 592 or so. 
and that's at a rate of about 73%, right? If you take that number, you know, five years later, 73% of that number becomes our kinder. So as that kind of hovers around that level, you can expect to see a kinder class still below 600 for us. And that's obviously something that Paul and I uh, and Dr. Flores always watch out for. And this is a combination of um, actual enrollment uh, and projected enrollment, right? So you just heard um, Ron discuss the uh, projections. I wanna make clear to everybody, these are the conservative projections because you heard him say, we use and they recommend um, conservative um, projections to be used for staffing, of course, and budgeting. So that's exactly what we do. So all these data points that are projections um, uh, coincide with his uh, numbers that he just presented. This year, um, it, I think that still will hold. Maybe it will be off by 10, a little bit or lower by 10 or so. But we've declined 1,030 students already. So I'm not looking at the projection piece. I'm looking at the last six years. If that 10,453 number that will be certified and finalized by February holds, we have, that's, that would be a fact at that point, declined over 1,030 in six years. So it's not out of the ordinary to think that Ron's projections are gonna be right because it calls for essentially a thousand student loss in a period of five years and another thousand students uh, in addition to that the next five years for a total of over 2,100 in a 10 year period. So uh, we know where the population of California is heading. We know where the county is heading. And so we are obviously part of that well as well. And this is an illustration of the financial impact of a declining enrollment. I haven't previously shared this with you, but I, it, that this is what FICMAT, the Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team, and their CEO is really worried about. And you ask Ron, do you have any good news? The good news is that we're on top of it. We're looking at it, we're paying attention, we're gonna be prepared for it. And this is what Mike Fine, the CEO of FICMAT, is really worried about. He's not really worried about the economy. He's worried about the fiscal impact of declining enrollment. And so I borrow this slide, basically the same thought from him. Uh, and uh, it's important because it, it, it conveys two things. Uh, we are obviously funded on average daily attendance, but we staff to enrollment. And so we have already taken advantage of the three prior year average for funding, and we're losing $2 million of funding. This year, because of that 171 student loss, it translates to that 165 or so for average daily attendance using the three-year average already, okay? And remember, we had those protections from COVID, so we're not even really hurting at that point because we were protected. Um, and then for staffing, what we can do is assuming a 32 to one, which is somewhat conservative, right? Using a beginning teacher, total compensation salary. This is not just their base salary, it's statutory rates, retirement, everything, right? 91,493 is an average total comp for a new teacher. There's teacher savings there that coincide with that ratio of 32 to one, given that uh, enrollment loss. And then the miscellaneous savings is really the um, allocation per student that go to the schools. So we adjust for that because less students, less allocation, et cetera. For a total savings of really 25% of what we should be looking for to really net out to zero, which is essentially saying we can save just on the formula basis through attrition, right? Um, about 25% of what we need. And then we still have a $1.5 million problem that if we don't address, the first thing that happens is that loss gets netted and lost behind the funded COLA. And then you eff effectively lose purchasing power for any positive COLA that's funded that given year. So obviously if you wanna address the real structural issues, then we've gotta come up with some really tough decisions meaning program cuts and other tough decisions to address that $1.5 million. And so um, the annual decline, these coincide with the um, numbers that Ron just uh, 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 mentioned to us. And, but then what I wanna highlight to you is I know the cost of living increase for next year will be higher, um, but that gets finalized in May. And we're not gonna sit here, pretend like we know what it is, the May uh, revision will have that final number. The governor's proposal, he's gonna flag and indicate that it will be higher, that's fantastic. But the LAO is saying, can you even fund the actual COLA? That's another matter. So of course, we expect it to be between seven and eight, perhaps even 
you know, a little bit over eight. Um, but can they fund it? It remains to be seen. Who knows what's going to happen to the economy between now and then? State revenues um, have to be, quote unquote, available revenues for the COLA to be funded. And it's somewhat concerning that the LAO is already saying the cost of living may be around 8.7. You can fund 8.3. Nobody's worried about the state so far, um, given the non-recessionary uh, picture, just weakening, uh, weak uh, revenues, but not, it's not a recession picture that they're painting right now. So it can get worse. Uh, the total uh, for supplemental and concentration funds are now 16 million, 16 million, precisely because of this unduplicated count hitting almost 60%. And that was the number that we had be planning, we had planned for 58. So thank you again for, for our community for uh, returning those lunch applications. It does absolutely matter. On the expenditure side, it's just the, the placeholder cuts to coincide with the staffing adjustments that we at least need to make. Again, only capturing 25% of what's truly needed in any given year. And the other um, assumptions are what we, you would normally see, uh, no adjustments to deferred maintenance match. Um, the STRS, CalSTRS and CalPERS contribution has finally, uh, over, over time at least for what we know now, for what we know now, they're stabilizing at that higher rate um, and they're, they're accounted for in the multi-year. This is somewhat hard to see, but I hope that you have a larger uh, page uh, in your packet. But again, just highlighting the historic 200 million in revenue, 208 expenditures, and you're saying, you call yourself a CBO, you're out of balance here. That's because we have a huge uh, beginning balance. Um, and those are the placeholders I have for the next year. And my beginning balance, I'm trying to get to the other slide. There we go. The beginning balance in the restricted programs is 9.7 million. And remember, we had uh, on the unrestricted side about $6 million worth of carryover. That's right here. So. Um, once you account for that, you're not able to see there's the dot. We have a true net increase to the general fund now of about $2 million, and that's what's important. Um, and then key to all our um, Prop 2 requirements, oops, no, it's messing with me. Um, we must comply with Proposition 2 that uh, sets the limits of the reserve to be no more than 10% uh, for a district our size. So we do have to revisit the board uh, committed balances such to bring the reserves down to 10%. And that's what you see before you. And that's what uh, resolution 22 slash 23 dash 21 is all about. We are at 10% reserve on the multi-year projection. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a self-certification process. The county reviews the first interim and then they issue the board president a letter uh, basically noting that they agree or disagree with our self-certification process. We will be monitoring, of course, uh, Kimberly and I will go to the governor's budget workshop um, after it's released in January. We'll be in Sacramento. And then negotiations are underway and we'll continue until uh, we have uh, a tentative deal and the multi-year projection will be uh, updated accordingly. Any questions? Questions, trustees? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Mesa. This is an action item. It is an action item. Move approval. Did it get a second? I'm sorry. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just go on? Sure. Uh, good well, evening. Wait. We're on C. We're on C. Master so, Development? Yes. Okay, yes. Item 9C, uh, it's a uh, new approval for a master development agreement between ABM Solutions and GUSD for developing and implementing a guaranteed energy savings project. If the board recalls, um, on October 20th, uh, we did bring uh, Tony uh, from ABM and reviewed a preliminary analysis that their uh, firm had conducted, really identifying between $500,000 to $600,000 worth of energy projects, uh, savings of potential energy projects that the district could undertake under government code 4217.10. Uh, and just so that uh, for the benefit of the public, that government code section allows the district uh, to fast track energy projects 
Um, but the key thing is that the savings have to be guaranteed. The total cost of such a, a vehicle um, like this energy uh, fee, engineering fee of $180,000 needs to then yield net savings, net savings to the district. And those savings are then guaranteed. So um, the agreement before you tonight um, will be to then further develop that preliminary analysis to have engineering work behind that so that then we can quantify and really establish an actionable plan and come back to the board with an agreement with specific projects in mind. Uh, and really at that point, uh, cross the I's or dot the I's and cross the T's, I guess is the saying, really for what expected savings are. Uh, the total uh, fee um, of 180000 at that point is fully expected to be absorbed by a project. ABM and the district is confident that they will identify a project that will yield net savings to the district so that those that cost can be absorbed by the project itself and ultimately need uh, savings to the district. Um, over a period of 20 years, uh, it could be anywhere between, I think, six or seven million dollars. Uh, of operational savings to the general fund. Questions, trustees? And Tony is here in case uh, there are any questions. Seeing no questions or comments, I'll entertain a motion. Ms. Michelle, I'll move approval. This is to an I second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Tony, for coming. So it looks like you're going to stay up there for a while. 9D, approval of resolution 22 slash 23 dash 1, committed general fund balance updated with board policy and district reserves. This is also an action item and a roll call vote. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is a, a, a key requirement of Prop 2. It, it does, uh, if you remember, on October. 20th, when the board uh, increased the minimum reserves from 7 to 10 percent. Prior to that, I had a designated amount of over $5 million just to allow that the, the board to go to up to 10 percent. That now has to change because the committed balances have to change so that we can stay um, at the required maximum of 10 percent reserve. Questions, trustees? Um, I have a question. In the actual resolution, the second to the last, be it, or the, yeah, be it therefore resolved, it says resolution 2122-21. Is that the right, or is it 2223? No, it is the no. old one. It's referencing the old one. Okay. Because so we, we have to undo it. Since it. Then. Yes. Okay. We have to undo it and replace it with this one. Thank you, Trustee Pace. No, no problem. Uh, move for approval. Second. All those in favor? No, it's a roll call vote. Oh, it's a roll call vote. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You told us a minute ago. I did. <laughs> yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to 9F, resolution 22 slash 23 dash. 22, approval of California Department of Education, CDE, continued funding application for fiscal year 23-24, and this also is an action item and a roll call vote. Good evening, President Paceno, members of the board, and Dr. Flores. Uh, this is the, um, a resolution that allows us to apply for funding to operate our state preschool program. Hmm. Questions, trustees? I have a question. <coughs> As your last presentation, anything you'd like to say? <laughs> um, well, well, I actually would. I, I do want to thank the members of the board. I, I am really very grateful to all of you. Um, I've had the opportunity in my career to work with uh, quite a few different boards of education, and I have a lot of uh, admiration and respect for anybody who chooses to serve as a board member. I think it's somewhat of a thankless job and there's a lot of work that goes into that. I'm very well aware. But I have to say this board is definitely the most supported, supportive and dedicated and involved uh, board that I've ever worked with. And I, I thank you for, for being interested and always um, assisting us and helping us achieve our goals. 
asking hard questions, you know, sometimes <laughs> it's really good. It, it makes us be better at our jobs and, and um, we really appreciate that. And just um, supporting the families and every student in this um, district. So thank you very much. Thank you, those thank are you. kind words. Appreciate it. No, I meant about the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll entertain a motion if there are no questions. Move approval. This is Melissa, I'll second. All those in favor? Roll call. Roll call. Aye. Oh, roll call. God, why do I keep doing that? I it, even... It's hard to find good help these days. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to be president, Mr. Nope. Good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have item 9G, 2022-23, Gary Unified School District Local Control Accountability Plan Mid-Year Review. This is an information item. Good Thank evening. you, Dr. Padilla. Yes, good evening once again. Uh, we are here this evening to present our mid-year review. It's something we do every year to sort of a status check on where we are in terms of our goals and actions in the local control accountability plan. So you're aware that the district has four main goals and these are described here. They have to do with the high quality instruction, how we support all students, positive school culture, and then basic services, which is goal number four. So in, in this presentation, we're going to highlight just a few of the actions in each of the goal areas. Um, number one, it has to do with how are we providing a high quality instructional program for our students. And we're going to focus on a few areas, professional development, curriculum support, technology, and coaching and mentoring. So um, we have, as you know, three um, district staff development days. Um, this is just one of the ways in which we provide professional development opportunities. And this slide shows some of the different um, areas of content or themes that we've provided uh, thus far. We have one more staff development day in January. Um, some of these uh, are offered as um, uh, choice sessions for our, um, for our teachers. Um, and some of them are offered in an ongoing manner, such as the view board training. We also support our administrators, and this year we have our administrators participating in a professional development series on special education, which equips them to do a better job of supporting students with IEPs. So you can see some of the topics there. We recently had one this last week. And in addition, um, in our principal meetings, uh, we have a number of topics that we provide to our principals um, to support them in their leadership. And you can see um, those listed there. And you're aware that we've, uh, we've invested a lot in technology. Um, and this is in support of our students using technology and our teachers as well. And so um, I mentioned view boards. We do have view boards in every classroom and teachers have had at least one level. They, many of them have had uh, more than the basic level. They've had, um, if they choose, they can go on to the advanced level, and that is ongoing. Um, so uh, when we walk around schools, we are pleased to see that they are in use and teachers are continuing to grow in their skills about how to use those technology tools. Goal number two is near and dear to my heart. Um, this is really how we look at the needs of different students and we figure out how best to address those needs. And so they, uh, the areas of support have to do with uh, culture and, uh, cultural and proficiency and equity training, but a lot of emphasis on data analysis, uh, analysis and progress monitoring through the professional learning communities process um, and, and again, looking at um, how, what are the levels of support for students? We always start with our tier one, which is our classroom instruction, and then we move higher and higher through the levels depending on the student's response to those needs. Um, we're doing a much better job, we're still not there yet, in creating systems of support. And finally, English learner support, which is one of our targeted student groups. This is a, a screenshot 
of what happens in the district professional learning communities. I want to acknowledge my colleague because she's done a tremendous amount of work in this area, getting schools and teams to work together, which, um, you know, the idea of having coordinated uh, collaborative conversations and um, looking together at the curriculum, planning together, having common assessments, so we are measuring the same things, and then figuring out what we're gonna do with that data, that's huge. And so again, this is an example of what happens at the middle school level, but it's also happening in high school. So at elementary, you're aware that we um, implemented universal screening this year, it's going very well. And um, again, the main process here is to think about what happens after you screen students and what do you do with the next step with diagnostic? How do you decide which students you're going to serve and what are you gonna serve them in and, and how are you gonna target those skills and then progress monitoring and then reassessing. Um, at the middle school level, an additional support is, are the middle school impact teams. Um, that has, again, it's, a, it's sort of an added supplement to the district PLC model. Um, having them work together, again, on uh, uh, developing some SMART goals as members of a content area team has been very effective, and then focusing on teacher and student efficacy. And at secondary level, the department leads those. Um, they're also supported by the site leaders. Again, common assessments, data analysis, and curriculum planning. This is no small feat when you try to get members of groups of different schools together uh, to uh, come to agreements for the benefit of the students. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, what's happening at elementary. We, are, we have for the last two, almost three years, been focused on literacy. And uh, as you know, we have a letters course that we have lots of teachers involved in. Now we're working with our literacy facilitators and our principals on the success factors. We just had a training today for our literacy um, uh, facilitators. We, we gave a many, all students got a universal screening instrument in the fall, all K through two students got one type of assessment and three through five got another type of assessment. From that, 782 students received a diagnostic. That meant that it told us that we needed to go further and find out more about what was going on with those students. And then with those, you can see we served in the first trimester 635 students in a pullout model. That doesn't mean that the remainder of students didn't get served. It means that they might have gotten served in the classroom because we're doing classroom interventions with the teacher and we're doing pullout interventions with our um, personnel that we have hired as part of our intervention team. You heard about that in the uh, elementary school plan presentations. English learner support, um, we still have Seal and Glad, and we're this year focusing in elementary on doing a better job with designated and integrated English language development. We're actually working on our EL program evaluation, which is to get kind of a self-study about what's going well. We're looking at a lot of data um, about the progress of our English learners, but also what are the weaknesses, I guess I'd say, or challenges with our instructional program and how can we shore that up to better support the students? And secondary is um, blessed to have their um, EL specialists, and some of those serve in a capacity to monitor student progress, and others work directly with teachers and provide professional development. They, we have some fantastic EL specialists. They're, they're doing a great job. At the high school level, we have what's called the academic language development courses, and those are at, um, both of comprehensive high schools, and then we have ELD specific classes for certain levels of students and enrichment and support. This is a, a shot from one of the, uh, we have an EL secondary um, coach, and she provides training for the EL instructional specialist. So they, this is um, a slide from one of her trainings. They were looking at a lot of different things and you know different structures, but also talking about what we call LTELs, which is long-term English learners, those students who've been here six years more or more and have yet to be reclassified. So something's getting in the way of them reaching the, that proficiency, either academic proficiency or linguistic. 
And finally, I believe last year you heard about OLAS, which was an organization we contracted with, and they did some training for our principals, and this year they're doing coaching, and the principals have identified what they call equity opportunities. They're setting goals around those areas, and then OLAS is providing coaching one-to-one -one for those administrators, and we've gotten really positive feedback from, from that. And now it's Dr. Padilla. So as part of goal three, which is really culture and climate, remember engagement per California is attendance. And we believe that the healthier our climates are, the more our students will want to attend. So they work hand in hand. So we are really focusing this year on addressing the social and emotional needs of our students. So we did um, give a survey at the beginning of the year specifically on climate per site. And um, as a reminder to the board, that same survey will go out in the spring because this is our baseline data. And we want to see based on the baseline data and any implemented actions that we do throughout the year, how that data may change by May. So this gives you an overall view of who participated in the survey. And the survey was given in um, English and Spanish to students and, st and parents and English to staff. So we are giving you a broad overview of the data district-wide. This is not the individual site-by-site -site data. Um, we do have that. We have shared that now with the staff, and we are currently in the process of reviewing that um, the site-by-site -site data and disaggregating it so that they can use it with their staff as well as their communities. Um, but we wanted to share some overall trends that we were seeing throughout the district. So as you can see in the area of respect, we have both parents and students saying that our adults at our schools are treating um, people with respect overall, um, average of 90%, um, which is wonderful for us. Um, also, um, at all three levels, an average of 55% of students and um, staff report that the students are treating adults with respect. So that is an area of need that we need to continue to work on. Um, for safety, we have 72% of our students who feel safe on campus and 80% of, of parents who report that their um, students feel safe. So there's a slight discrepancy there. So we wanna look into that a little bit more. And 72% of students report having a trusted adult at school to talk to. We want that to be 100%. Right now, what we're doing is disaggregating that to see the different levels um, because we do have an assumption that there is a difference between how elementary students feel compared to how high schools and middle schoolers feel. So we are still working at looking at that at the different levels and the different sites so we can get a better idea to address that issue. In terms of inclusion, there are some discrepancies here. So we're seeing that 14% of students report that they personally um, have been treated differently, yet there is a higher percent of students that they say that they witness people being treated differently. So that can be caused by several factors, um, one of which is goes back to that 72% feeling um, like they have a trusted adult to talk to, right? If that were 100%, maybe these numbers might match. So those are the types of things that we're looking into to see um, what we can do to improve in these areas. Um, obviously, our goal is that there are no students that feel like they are treated differently in a negative way on our campuses, either by adults or by their fellow students. Um, with discipline and conflict resolution, 74% of our students do believe that discipline issues are handled fairly. And 74% of students and 84% of parents report that there are conflict resolution practices in place to repair relationships. And we believe that that um, has gone up because we do now have all of our secondary administrators trained in restorative practices. And now we are working, um, we'll be working with elementary as well as now with teacher teams at all of the secondary sites. We believe that the restorative training 
um, has really assisted us in looking at our discipline and our view of discipline overall, and will continue to improve our data as we do more implementation in this area. We continue to have a lot of professional development around equity and diversity and how to work um, with people basically who are different from ourselves um, so that we have a better understanding of our entire community. Um, we, as Ms. Bierman stated, we've done a lot of administrator training this year in these same areas, um, but with a specific focus on how we support students in the area of discipline. We've also increased our training to support more of our classified staff, and this just gives you a, a snapshot of the training that was well received and very well done for our campus supervisors um, across the campus. We actually did just finish a second training with Circle Up with our campus supervisors as well um, to help them um, de-escalate situations on campus when they arise. This slide probably looks familiar to you because we've used a, the similar sl slide for our mental health presentation. As you know, we have increased our mental health staff within the district significantly, um, as well as in um, working with all of our partners in a variety of areas. We are very, very lucky in Gilroy to have wonderful community agencies that help our, our students as well as our entire community. You'll see on this slide the number of staff that we currently have in the various positions, which again is a significant increase from prior to COVID. A lot of that is um, thanks to the work of Anna Polito, our director in student services, who has worked with not only the agencies, but these contracts, as well as um, Dr. Winslow and Human Resources, finding all of these people to fill these positions. So we're very lucky to have them as well. With our social emotional needs, we have also implemented curriculum at the various sites, or we have continued with curriculum that we have had in the district. So at elementary, they are using second step curriculum um, that is um, both social emotional and does focus on bully prevention. As secondary, it's character strong that focuses more on the individual and what they can do to be a better citizen and to prevent um, things such as bullying on campus. So goal four focuses on our clean, safe, and well-maintained facilities. Um, this is Mr. Mesa's area, and he has shown you a snapshot of where we have spent money um, just recently, $533,000, um, just to improve our facilities and keep them safe and clean for, um, for our students. So a high quality staff, uh, again, for um, the benefit of our audience and for the board, high quality staff is people that are credentialed. That's what it refers to, is are they appropriately credentialed for what they are teaching? So our human resource um, office, um, led by Dr. Winslow, has done an amazing job of finding people out of thin air. Um, sometimes we tease him that um, he has started a cloning program that we have, don't know about yet, it's secret. Um, because we have had, um, like throughout California, struggles in finding teachers, um, yet he has and his staff have done an incredible job of getting us um, staff members to fill all of these, p these positions. Um, some are virtual, but the majority are in person who are here supporting our students. Um, we have also this year reinstated our a new teacher mentor program with the benefit of some one-time funding that we have. And we're getting great feedback from that um, where sometimes they're you know, on their own, just, oh, well, we, we're just gonna stop by. So making great connections for our new teachers within this, the school site and just having that person who can go by and help our brand new people who honestly just don't know what they don't know yet. So those people are there to help them with paperwork, with you know, student issues in the classroom, with curriculum, or simply just to say hello and have a great day. For our mid-year outcomes, we do do a review at this time of year of our entire um, LCAP plan, 
and we look and see where we're at and where we're going. So as you can see, we've got the different metrics um, used with our data um, for the different areas. We do use CASP, which as you know, has been a challenge this year because we have not had CASP data for a while. Um, they did just do the release of the new information for the state that was just released today. Um, so we will be looking at that and making adjustments um, based on our new data from the state. Um, for goal two metrics, we do look at how our students are progressing in different areas. Again, this is more on benchmarks and other um, measures other than CASP. And goal three is focused heavily on attendance and suspension and how we are doing. And then we are in a constant state of development for the LCAP. So we are currently at this mid-year review. We are doing it a little bit early. We, it's normally in January, but um, I wanted Kathleen as she has been one of the main leads for our LCAP and has done a fabulous job for many years on our plan to be here to do this presentation. Um, I am personally very sad to see her go. Um, so, but I have her home phone number, so she can't get away that easily. So our next step after this is we will be doing our LCAP survey, which we have pulled out the school climate questions <coughs> that we used to have as part of that survey because we now have the site level um, climate survey. So the LCAP survey will mainly focus on our budget as well as some academic areas and our SRO program. And then we will be starting our LCAP sessions with the county office as well as with all of our community support groups and our community partners, which include all of the site level parent committees, our school site councils, our um, English language advisory committees, as well as other um, parent groups and organizations. We also work with our GTA. Um, and our classified and para groups on getting input for the LCAP. That starts in February and continues on through April as we write our plan. And then in April, we send a review to the Santa Clara County Office of Education where they look at not only our plan, but also our budget to see if they're in alignment. We bring a draft presentation here to you in May and then ideally we have it approved in June and then we get the final approval from the county in August. Questions? Questions, Trustee Twin. Um, I know that last time when we did the, sur the climate surveys, it was not broken down into demographics. Um, for this round, are, can I make a request to break it down into uh, demographics? For all of our surveys, the LCAP survey, um, which I know well because I just wrote it, um, is yes, broken down by demographics, not only by school, but by um, gender identity, as well as um, by language spoken at home, all of our typical demographics, grade level, et cetera. As well as uh, social economic? As the best of our ability. Okay. Yes, so we ask families if they participate in any of the um, of our programs um, that is self-reported so it is to the best of our ability any other questions mr pace so on <clears throat> on the uh, mid-year outcome slide there's a desired outcomes for 23-24 uh, do you think those are reasonable uh, outcomes 58 percent uh, ela 50 percent math from that's quite a jump from the 22 numbers. It is, and what I want to remind the board is that we actually put these outcomes, this plan is an ongoing plan. Okay. So we plan out for three years, and those are our goals. Those are our aspirations, and of course we need to have high goals. Well, we set high standards By that logic, for ourselves. why aren't those all 100%? However, <laughs> yes, um, we, will, we do modify our goals. Um, as we receive information and data um, and make adjustments. Um, that's why the plan is an ongoing plan. And we work with closely with Mr. Schrock, who is our data guru, um, who helps us make some, sometimes some more reasonable expectations on those goals. So yeah, those, those um, you know, it's a, the LCAP is a three-year plan. And so when we wrote, the, we're going into year three next year. So when we set the first year up two years ago, 
it, that asked yeah. us to set a three-year goal. And at that time, we weren't expecting right, <laughs> the, what the, the circumstances that affected us, but we're not going to adjust those, even though at this point we may say, you know, we may not make those. Okay. And then uh, after 23, 24, we'll leave those in place. And then 24, 25 for year one of the next three-year cycle, we'll probably adjust a three-year outlook based on where we are two years from now. Yeah. And, that seems reasonable. And although the, our numbers since the pandemic have decreased, we also know, and research is very strong, that says with um, high efficacy with our teachers and strong teaching, we can grow anywhere from two to three years in one year. And so we know that our teachers, we have exceptional teachers. So we do expect to see growth. We know it will take a couple years to get back to where we were and continue on that path, but we know it, we will definitely be moving faster than most. Thank you, and I um, have lived two and three years growth in one year, so I know it's possible. So thank you for having those uh, high expectations of staff and, and students. Any other questions from trustees, comments? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Item 9H, increase in service agreement with effective school solutions for the 22-23 school year, an increase of $117,954, not to exceed $867,954. This is an action item, Ms. Polito. Uh, good evening, President Pacino, board members, and Dr. Flores. I'm here to bring forth a contract to fill a vacancy for a uh, employee that, that moved to a different position. Okay. Questions, trustees? Trustee Good. So, so we're gonna, we had a, an employee, and now we're going to replace the employee with the contractor? Uh, yes. Great. And mm -hmm. thanks for supplying all the documents we need to prove oh. this. <laughs> Thank you. I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. This is not a roll call vote, <laughs> so all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Item 10, right? A monthly maintenance operation. I was wondering why you weren't getting up, Mr. Nato. Um, <laughs> Step to it. Come I on. know. I, <laughs> did I wake you? Action information items. Good evening, President Paceno, <laughs> members of the board. Welcome, Trustee Kim. Um, I'll commence with our quick update for facilities department. Um, next month, I hope to bring a, a new partner to this presentation. Awesome. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Let's see. A uh, quick update is our Luigi uh, Prea playground and perimeter fence. Uh, so the playground will be completed before the students come back from Christmas break, um, barring any unforeseen issues. But as many of us know, we toured it earlier last Friday, and uh, I believe Trustee Pace uh, test drove pretty much everything on there and <coughs> approved. It's pretty good stuff. <laughs> pretty much every item. Uh, it's looking great. Uh, I believe the pour in place is going in. Um, if it hasn't already gone in, I know they were doing ground moisture testing, so if it hasn't already gone in, it'll be going in early next week. Uh, and then the perimeter fence is also going in. They're waiting for the ground to harden up so they can drive their trucks across, but uh, the project will uh, close out pretty quickly, and hopefully the students will be very happy uh, come uh, January 3rd, I believe, when they come back. Uh, this is a look, uh, actually, uh, uh, just before the, um, I think before our tour, right after. Um, so that's how it's looking now. It didn't have the pour in place. <clears throat> These are all the different structures, and yes, I do believe Trusty Pace was on all of those. Actually, let the record photos. show, I did not, I can't vouch for the slides because it was pretty wet. That's true. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring you back next week. Uh, let's see. So yeah, it, so this is how it's currently looking. We're I'm very happy with it. It's uh, it's coming along great, and uh, the fence should be going in next week. These are all the different um, uh, interactive panels. Uh, there's um, learn sign language. There's a small maze. 
There's what I call the Vanna plate, which is really a tic-tac-toe game, but it also hunts for um, those letter turning uh, skills. Um, so these are really nice, they're, and they're interchangeable. So if one doesn't um, show popularity, they can be swapped out, which is very cool. The perimeter fence will go on uh, within that yellow boundary there. And as you can see, all the posts are in place. Um, we just need to finish that off. Um, there was a question earlier that uh, if there was any gates on that. So this particular fence does not have any gates. It's just edge to edge. We do have access um, through other means, uh, other pre-existing gates. On to South Valley. So as we uh, heard earlier, all the structural framing for both of the large uh, scale buildings are done. The admin building is complete with its uh, steel structure as well as the gym. Um, and thank you all who were able to attend the topping off. That was awesome. Um, that was a nice little uh, ceremony that we were able to do. It's a very rare occurrence in, in school construction because you don't generally build with steel. Uh, it's usually modular uh, engineering. Uh, so as you can see, this is an aerial of both the sites. Um, the gym at this particular time, uh, at the time we built the slide, uh, didn't have any of the steel uh, constructed. So that's how fast that goes up. Uh, the presentation had to be uh, um, uh, submitted before we were able to get a good shot of the gym being done. <coughs> uh, let's see, uh, other shots of both the admin and the gym. Um, and I do believe, uh, so Dr. Flores, I, you know, if, when you want to go back, we'll go ahead and uh, do another tour. And anybody who wasn't able to attend, please feel free. Uh, let's see. So here we're, do we're drilling for the, uh, the shade structures that are going to go in the amphitheater. That's actually occurring <laughs> right now. So they're drilling uh, concrete pillars. They're actually pretty deep subterranean. And you can't really see it that well on the left-hand photo, but there are two shade structures that'll go over the amphitheater. Um, and so that's what they're drilling for there. And this is, this is actually currently my computer desktop. This is a rendering of, uh, if you're standing out on IOF Avenue looking towards where the new gym will be, this is a night perspective of the uh, Burtmar gym that will uh, be lit up and that you can see the tiger profile in relief uh, it's going to look great. It'll look even better than that. And that concludes my presentation. Now I'll move quickly on to my four items. Uh, item 10B is a uh, construction contract with Kent Construction for the installation of office space within the Wellness Center at GECA, not to exceed $95,558.75. Um, so this is a... Uh, this is an interior office to room 10 at GACA. This will house our community solutions uh, consultant that comes in on site uh, to work with the students. Item 10C is Mr. our- Mr. Nader, do you wanna take questions or comments for each item or at sure. the end? Yeah, we can take, yeah. Yep. Any questions on 9B, <laughs> trustees? Okay, go ahead. Uh, item 10C is our contract with EnviroScience for the final phase of our um, uh, hat industrial um, hygiene uh, oversight for the South Valley gym uh, demolition and then the ancillary buildings that are around that. There's three. There's uh, two changing rooms and a uh, pool pump house. Those are the final buildings to come down. And as you know, we do all of our environmental in-house, we've uh, contracted with EnviroScience to complete that work. Uh, that'll take place uh, partially in February and then again partially in March, uh, both on, when the schools are on break. Questions, comments, trustees? Okay, proceed. Let's see, item 10D is the approval of a contract amendment with ADIS Architects for the additional services on Farrell Avenue Preschool Project. Uh, it's an increase of $42,690 to the original contract amount of $287,025 with a new total amount of $325,000 and 17, or $725,715. $725, it's a late day. Uh, <laughs> so this is actually the, uh, in the original scope, we had not planned for a parking lot. Um, 
Ironically, I had not noticed that there was not a parking lot, something that you generally wouldn't overlook. Um, so within the design, there's a pickup and drop off lane that's always been there. Um, in this particular environment, there was not a, there's no staff parking on that side of the, of the property. So I asked Aidis to actually develop that into the overall plans. So this is actually an alt ad. They'll, they'll go back and they'll plan for installing parking uh, in a pickup and drop off lane at, at that site. And that'll actually just reduce the landscaping that's currently in site. Questions, comments, trustees. Trustee Good. So uh, thank you for, for giving us the schematics. Now we know what we're looking at. So this is actually on Farrell Avenue? Yeah. It is on Farrell Avenue, yes. Okay. And so we're going to remove that greenscape and create a parking lot? Yeah, we'll reduce the greenscape. It won't uh, entirely disappear. There'll be about a two-foot well, and we'll allow... Uh, which will we're just going to uh, maintain trees within those wells uh, mm -hmm. right on the uh, street side are, are we subject to any of the, the city requirements for landscaping or are we exempt we're exempt on our property from all city um, regulations unless unless there's something that's out there that I'm not aware of but yeah on our property we are exempt right and, and I'm assuming that the the architect grinds are required under DSA regulations because yeah, it, otherwise it'd be hard to justify 42,000 from taking out some lawn and drawing some lines, right? Yes. Is, so my, is my assumption correct? Yes, there are, yeah, there's a number of issues that even I was unaware of that number of sites, uh, pickup drop off, ADA compliance for the pickup and drop off, the number of students being served uh, has to, there's a ratio of, of parking stalls, that kind of thing, all right. stuff that's Thank you. You bet. Other questions, trustees? Okay, proceed to E. All right, and the last item is item 10E. This is a uh, construction amendment with Anaya Construction. And this is, so this is during our, one of our recent DSA inspections at the playground at Luigi, uh, the DSA inspector noticed that there was a, a ramp Actually, he noticed or knew of multiple ramps going into the existing portables that were non-compliant. Uh, one was not within our scope, and he's asked that it be corrected. So we're actually taking steps to modify the entrance to that third portable to create a, um, a, a an ADA-compliant uh, entry ramp. So that is an addition of $18,500 to the uh, original contract. Questions or comments? Okay, I will entertain a motion to approve items 10B through E. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Nato. Thank you, good evening. And we go on to item 11, board member reports. Do you have any? Uh, it's Michelle, just yes. real, real quickly. Um, I know um, Melissa was there too, but uh, we um, went to a presentation by the Christopher High School Choir and also the South Valley Choir. And it was pretty special because Kira Dixon's um, maternal, paternal uh, grandparents were uh, Japanese. And she did a presentation with the help of a composer from Southern California a PowerPoint with music on the um, internment camps, and uh, it was very well done. And I don't know if it's going to be available later on, but um, it was part of her uh, winter concert. But it was called Journey Home, and she put a lot of work into it. And so it was good. very special. And there were some Japanese sounding themes in the music. He did a really good job. And so, and and he was there. Yeah, so he did a little intro himself. Awesome. Anything else? Any other trustees? Okay, item 12, upcoming and new referral agenda items. Anybody have anything? Okay, item 13, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education is tentatively scheduled for Thursday. Or can we remove the tentative? Um, is scheduled for January 12th, 2023. Closed session will begin at 5.30, followed by a regular session at 7 p.m. The agenda will be available on the district's website 
by 5 p.m. on Friday, January 6th. And we are adjourned.